Okay, thanks. Thank you all for coming. And um, so I, I do have the word functions and formulas in the title. Now, some of you, have, we have different relationships to formulas probably in the room. So when you, if you are of the type where you see equations and you start feeling a little tightness in the stomach, just think of the first syllable of function, which is what? Yes. Okay. And, you know, I hope that there'll be enough so that we can uh, put in some movies and pictures so that hopefully you'll be able to understand everything, even if you don't like equations. So um, I'm talking today about some work I've done over the past 15 years or so, but it's really uh, the theme I want to remember is it's good for people to talk to each other, Pe mathematicians to talk to doctors, um, artists, uh, neuroscientists, everybody. You can hear me okay, right? I, my ears aren't sticking out, are they? Like weird. Okay. All right, and I put on here, I usually put a picture of where I'm from when I go talk places, but since you know where Claremont is, I put a picture of our new math building. Um, and uh, you can see this is the top of the stairs looking into the math floor. And I invite you all to come Saturday. We're having a ginormous party um, Saturday, 2 to 7. And we'll have lots of fun and games and little primetime math talks and um, music featuring the Millican Family Band, among others. Okay, So I invite you warmly to come. All right, so I'm going to talk today about mathematics applied to cancer uh, treatments. Now, this is not a small topic. A recent search in Web of Science showed up. Uh, if, I, if you do cancer mathematical model, I got close to 3,000 hits. So we're not going to cover all of that today. Just a tiny, tiny little view of things, and um, hopefully to give you a taste of what, of what this kind of collaborative work can be like. Very close. <laughs> good, good eye, Chuck. Good eye. So I, I um, there's. I want to give you the backstory how this started. Of course, we all love mom. In this case, mom stands for mathematics, uh, uh, mathematics of medicine study group. So I was sitting, I was pretty new here at Pomona College, minding my own business in my office. When someone comes by, I forget who it was, and says, "Amy, there's an alum." who needs someone to go down to St. Vincent's Hospital in LA and explain to these doctors what chaos theory is. Being a new faculty member and eager to please, I of course hopped in my car and went over there. And in the basement cafeteria in St. Vincent's were all these doctors in their white lab coats and everything, trying to read math papers about cancer. And um, I gave them my usual chaos talk, you know, love and hate. And, you know, competition, and and um, I just thought this was such a cool group. I, you know, the dedication and the persistence um, that I kept coming back to their study group, and finally, um, we developed models of our own, and that's what I'm going to talk about. This is Chuck Wiseman, who is the main instigator behind the Mathematics and Medicine study group, and um, he's still comes by now and then and, and is still very active in designing cancer vaccines. He now has his own company in um, Los Angeles. My other collaborators, before I, I like to mention them before I forget, <laughs> are Sarah Hook, who's an immunologist in New Zealand, where I spent my last sabbatical, Lizette DePellis, who's up at Harvey Mudd, and Angela Gallegos over at LMU. So they've helped, and uh, lots of other people along the way, but those are the main people. So why were these doctors in the cafeteria reading math papers? Why do you think? You don't think I was doing all the talking, did you? They're in the, why are they reading math papers? Maybe figure out something that wasn't making sense. What wasn't making sense? Well, they were taught in medical school that this is how a tumor would grow. You'd start with a cell and it would divide, and then you'd have two cells, and those would divide, you'd have four cells, and those would divide, you'd have eight cells, and those would divide, and you'd have 16 cells, and then after K doublings, you'd have two to the K cells, excellent. And um, 
What, and then what are the implications of that? So we call that exponential growth. What are the implications of exponential growth? Well, if you start with one cell, there's one breast cancer cell. If, uh, if the doubling time is around two days, more or less, that's what it is, then it takes about 44 days to grow to a detectable seven millimeter size. And in about 98 days, it'll be the size of a beach ball. And so that just, the doctors thought, that's just not realistic. This is a graph of exponential growth, not realistic. What, in fact, did they observe? They observed maybe um, air graph. What do you think they observed? Air graph. Yeah, maybe goes up and levels off maybe, and maybe like that, stops growing. Or maybe it stops, starts, stops, right? So they were trying to understand, rather than this doubling, 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 and there were other things that were bothering them, like when they gave chemotherapy, you know, you'd think that all the tumor would go down, then it would come back up, but it wasn't quite doing that. So there was something else going on, and they were interested in understanding that. And so that's partly um, what I want to talk to you about, but um, I want to talk about it in the context of vaccines, because this is the new... Uh, sort of the big push in cancer treatments. Immunotherapy is uh, treatments that boost the immune response to whatever, but in this case, cancer, um, with sort of biological responses that you already have, but you modify those to make them stronger. A vaccine is a special type of immunotherapy where you use uh, tumor cells that are maybe modified, made less, you know, radiate or something, to um, initiate a specific response to that type of cell. And um, they're mainly used in cancer therapeutically, not yet preventatively. So it's not like measles or mumps where you take the vaccine so you don't get it. You take these vaccines after you have cancer to boost the response to your own cancer. Sometimes these are the only options, say other treatments have not worked. But now, more and more, that's how it used to be. More and more now, they're thinking of it as a first-line defense or a first defense used in combination with other things. Some cancers have been shown to be particularly good candidates, like prostate cancer, melanoma, some gliomas, so things where they can identify specific proteins uh, associated with those cancer cells that they can then design the vaccines to actually attack. The benefits are that they're not as toxic as taking a drug that kills everything. Um, and potentially they can be very effective because you're fighting the tumor yourself. So that's the hope. Now, we have a lot of immune cells in our body. This is just some of them. We're going to focus today on two types. These T lymphocytes, T for thymus, that's where they come from, and these dendritic cells, which are, well, you'll see what they do in a minute. So they uh, sort of present the foreign substance to these T cells, and then the T cells go and attack the tumor. Okay, so those are the two sort of players that we're going to look at first. Now the immune system, I'm not going to really tell you how it works totally, but just vaguely, we have a whole bunch of white blood cells, about a thousand million we make per day, and we have some natural immunity. These are like patrols that go around, and if you know the secret handshake, you're cool. If you don't, you're a cell that doesn't know it, you're dead. It's the idea. But then we have the specific immunity, and this is the kind that the vaccines are targeting mostly, which is like a glove-sniffing dog. You say, here's the thing you want to go kill. Go find it. Go find it. And then they go find a cell that looks just like that, and they attach to it and kill it. So I'll show you a little cartoons of that. So this is the natural handshake, the secret handshake kind of model. You see if the cell has a certain uh, molecule on it. If it does, you're, it's fine. If it doesn't, then you kill it. Um, and these are natural killer cells. This is a sort of a cartoony picture of it killing tumor cells. It's just kind of they shoot these little granules at it that destroy the membrane. Now the adaptive immune response, one we're most interested in, Starts with a T cell, so there are a bunch of kinds of T cells, and they see if they recognize a particular protein on a cell. If they do, then they attach to it, and there, they, there are a couple ways they can kill it. There's a little movie I have of, I just think it's so cool. 
that they can make movies of this. There it is. This kind of deflates it. There's a sound that goes that, that did, you didn't, did you hear that? I think they made the sound up. I don't think that. But anyway, so that's what we're talking about. We want to elicit that kind of response. Was that real time? Good question. I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> I think it's pretty fast, though. Pretty fast. So um, mathematically, now here's where some of the fun comes. <laughs> mathematically, we're going to write down formulas that describe all these cells interacting with each other, and then we're going to use that mathematical model to sort of answer some questions that we want that we wonder about. So basic idea of this is a predator-prey model. I'm putting this on here because some of you have seen predator-prey models. So in this case, we've got the predator, the Canada lynx, and the prey, the snow hare. And we write down some differential equations that look like this. They're really fun. This is the, the snow hare growing, right? It, and you just break it up into pieces. This is the snow hare and the Canada lynx interacting in a kind of negative way for the, for the snow hare. This is the death rate of the Canada lynx, which can't live without eating. And then this is the positive effect of its encounter with the snow hare. Okay, so we just kind of build up models like this. If I'm working with someone, they don't have to know how to write differential equations. They just tell me how things interact. And then we write down that description in this fun way. Make sense? So in our case, the predators are the immune cells, the natural killer cells, and the cytotoxic T cells. And we'll have these, our first model, you know, just had tumor cells, natural killer cells, these cytotoxic T cells. And we write down three equations that have, you know, growth, interaction, interaction, C for competition, really, growth, competition, growth, competition. And our first discovery was that, you know, so you have to figure out what these terms look like. Our first discovery was that the natural killer cells and these T cells actually acted different mathematically. So we fit, um, we got some data on, you know, this is, this is the ratio of cytotoxic killer cells to tumor cells, and this is the percent killed. And these little dots are different patients. We tried to fit it to this kind of a function we didn't get a very good fit. That's our best fit. This kind of a function, curvy one, we got a, an almost perfect fit. And so it was, a, it was a way to distinguish between the adaptive and the innate immune response with a function, which is really cool. And um, we published it in 2005, and it's by far the most cited paper I have. And Dr. Wiseman, so that's what the function looks like. <laughs> Care. He calls it the Depillus Red and Sky Law, which I think is so cool. Yeah, you can call it that too now. Um, and you'll see this appear later on. But but the point was that even then, you know, people who knew nothing about uh, models or anything, it was a way to just have a glob of cells and say these are killing in a different way by just plotting them, which was awesome. Okay, now back to cancer vaccines. So one of the first uh, big trials uh, was uh, Provange, a uh, cancer uh, dendritic cell vaccine, which is the type I'm going to talk about, for prostate cancer. This is off their web page. Notice they use the same picture I found. And, um, you know, there was a lot of hype around it. This was in 2010, a uh, culmination of decades of research, harnessing the immune system. This is also on their web page. It's the, uh, it's the, schedule that you get. So you, you go in, the, the way this works is you go in, you, you're trying to get rid of your cancer, they take some of your immune cells out, then they beef them up and make them propagate and make them stronger. Two day, three days later you come back and they infuse them back into you, and then you do it again two, two weeks later and then two weeks later, and all is well. That's off their website. and the questions, though, that <laughs> doctors have are really uh, how much should you give, you know? Because you take cells out of someone. I messed this up. Can you still hear me? And their number of cells vary widely. So usually they just give as much as they can. But the other thing is how often. So that schedule you saw, I, I, I did some looking around. It turns out it's been locked in since 
they tried it on the first patient in 1997. It kind of worked, so they just said that's how we're going to do it. And now that's FDA approved, they have to do it that way, right? So, but it's like, why? Why is that the right thing to do? Where? Where should you inject it? Where the tumor is? Where the, where the immune cells are being generated? Uh, maybe in the blood, just get all around. Um, and these uh, questions are hard to answer if you only have live patients to mess with, right? That's why mathematical models could be really good. And that was our idea. Also, they've had sort of mixed responses, so it'd be nice to use a model to be able to tell who will respond to treatment. So here's a little movie that um, the company that's doing this trial kindly made, and it kind of tells you how the whole thing works. I thought, just a less than two minutes long. Tumor cells have developed mechanisms oh. to avoid detection by the immune system. When left undetected, tumor cells will continue to grow and progress. However, the possibility exists to exploit an inherent characteristic of tumor cells in the fight against them. Tumors express tissue-specific antigens, which may be used to target tumor cells. The potential lies in harnessing the power of the body's own immune response. When activated, antigen-presenting cells, also known as APCs, are in turn responsible for T-cell activation. Scientists are currently studying different ways of activating APCs so that on exposure to a particular antigen, APCs will take up and process that antigen in preparation for T-cell activation. The antigen peptides are presented on the APC surface. The APC starts to mature. It's a dendritic cell right there. To the lymph system. Here, mm. it completes its maturation and encounters T-cells. It selects the T cells that possess the antigen receptors matching the antigen peptides on the APC surface. The APC then presents the antigen to the T cell. Antigen presentation, together with other inflammatory signals, results in T cell activation. When activated, the T cells multiply. These T cells can now seek out and recognize that particular antigen. As a result, Activated T cells attack target cells. Activated T cells may be the immune system's most potent defense against cancer. Okay, so that's uh, so there. You know, we see the movie, and then we, as mathematicians, we want to make a model, a bunch of functions that describe all that stuff that happened. And so that that's our job. Oh, I'm sorry. Jeez. I'm sorry. Just stop this. Okay. Um, okay. So there are a lot, as you can imagine, there are a lot of equations necessary to model all that. So uh, don't uh, glaze over too much. Um, but I'm going to show you a few of them and then see what we can do with it. So first, a few of the challenges that are inherent in designing cancer vaccines. Um, most vaccines, you try to get a lot of antibody. But here we're trying to elicit a cellular response, and that's really hard to measure because the immune cells are living in your spleen and organs. You can't really measure how many there are unless you do it on a mice and sacrifice them, right? So uh, it's tricky to get really good quantitative uh, numbers, but a fortun I'm fortunate to have a collaborator that helps with that. Then um, you have to optimize that response, you know, so those, you saw the, the T cells, you know, proliferating, you want to optimize that, whereas at the same time, the body is trying to, sorry, the body is trying to shut down the response, because uh, we don't want too big an immune response ever, because that is called an autoimmune disorder, and that really screws you up too. So there's this really delicate balance that we have to maintain, which makes these vaccines very tricky, which makes mathematical models really useful. Um, so I'm going to show you for our first stage in this, which was trying to get the, those kinetics of, remember, you saw the dendritic cell come in and then attach to the T cell, and then they started reproducing. And so the, our first step was just to model that part of it. And I did this with my collaborator, Sarah. She she could uh, put into mice radioactively labeled T cells into nude mice. They had no immune cells, so you knew how many there were, give them the vaccine, and then 
count how many there were at, after certain time points. I won't tell you what she had to do to do that. But um, this vaccine is a peptide, a, a protein that's recognized by these dendritic cells. So it's this indirect thing. So we are going to have the dendritic cells come in. And you saw that they have to attach themselves to these sort of naive T cells. And then a little while later, they get activated. So there's this time factor in there that's crucial. Um, and like I said, there's this self-regulatory response we have to be careful with. So here in this first model, we're going to have these stages of cells. So the naive T cell, and then the, the uh, dendritic cell comes in. After some time, it activates it. They become proliferating. You saw them grow more of them. And then after a certain amount of time, the immune system naturally shuts that process down. They either become apoptotic, which means quickly dying, or they go off and kill the tumors, or they become memory cells and hang around till the next time they see a challenge with the same thing, which we want some of those memory cells around too. So here we go. Here's a, here's a big slide of equations. So if you're hungry and you don't like equations, you can now focus on your food. We have the naive cell. Then we have the memory cells. They're hanging around already. The dendritic cell comes in and, and uh, activates them. <laughs> That's what that equation looks like. They become proliferative. Here's the P for proliferative. And there is a lot of messy equations in there because that process is fairly complicated. There are delays and other things. And then they, the contraction phase where they die off quickly or become memory cells or go off in the blood and do their thing. And here the memory cells just, uh, they, get, they, they are created in this phase and then they also have some homeostatic state. Okay, so that's what the equations look like for each cell type. Um, we, we also have the input, which is the vaccine. That's the blue line. So just remember that this blue thing is the thing we get to control. It's the only thing we get to control. And we want to find the vaccine that does whatever the best, which we'll talk about. OK, so Sarah did some experiments. She, she doesn't really look like that. She, you saw a picture of her before. She injects the mice with this vaccine and then um, and these special cells that she can measure. And then she, she counts them at various time points. And then I had my mathematical model, and I just tried to fit it to the data. So it looks pretty good. But what I want you to notice here is that these are the uh, one type of immune cells, which are called helper cells. They sort of peak a little while later, and then they kind of die off and become memory cells. And then these are the killer cells. They do the same thing, but these peak a little sooner. I mean, sorry. These come a little later than the, this one. So the timing issues are really important. I, it, and to see that, I made this little movie for you guys. So on the left are the helper cells, and the right are the killer cells. You can see the naive ones, the proliferating ones, the memory ones, and the active ones. And then all that's left after a while are the memory ones. Did you like that movie? I want to see it again. See, because I think that's cool how those formulas can um, really capture these interactions and the kind of complicated kinetics. So now, what can we do with this model? We think, you know, it fits the data pretty well, et cetera. Um, well, we want to know when to give the vaccines, let's say. Because cancer vaccines are weak, cancer uh, vaccines are weak. They don't, we need to give them several times boost. You saw in the FDA trial, they're doing it three times, right? Um, so one question might be when to give these repeated things. Every two weeks, is that good or sooner? I mean, you saw those graphs, uh, but maybe you don't want it, you know, just so many immune cells all the time, because then remember the immune system will shut it all down and you won't have any response at all. So we want to find the optimum boosting schedule. Now remember, here's what we saw. This is days here. Maybe you can't see this peak here is around seven days, this is around six days. So you're, Sarah, designing the vaccine. When would you think to give the boost? Six maybe where it's at the top here. That's what she thought, six or seven days. So what I did was see, to see if uh, mathematically we could check that out or find something better. So um, remember, we have that blue input function. 
That's the thing we get to pick. And our goal is to find that time of giving the function and the boost to maximize the immune response. Well, what does that mean? We don't really know. Maybe you want to maximize the number of killer cells in the blood. Right? Remember, there are all those populations. Maybe you want to maximize the number of memory cells are left so that they're there for the next time. Or maybe you want some combination of both. There's no one right answer. I know my students sometimes hate I give these problems with no one right answer. Huh? But uh, that's the way life is. So you just try different things and see what works best. Now, we can't give infinite amount of vaccines, so we, we just say, well, the amount of vaccine is going to be something between zero and some maximum value. Uh, OK, so that, remember, that's what it looks like. So one thing is we can, we can represent this blue line as a sort of on-off thing, right? And we're going to use what we call heuristic optimization methods. Manayan knows a lot about this. And so we have an expert on this in the room, which is great. So here, this I'm going to show you one kind of, this is called a heuristic optimization technique. It's something you can use anytime it, uh, because it doesn't give you the very, very best, but it's sort of a pretty good guess at the best. Um, and it successively finds better things. So we're going to represent our vaccine as an on and an off. And so we can put sort of a 1 whenever it's on and a 0 whenever it's off at little points in time. This is time. Make sense? So on for the song, off, on, off. And now we think of each of these sequences of 1s and zeros as a chromosome in a population. This is called a genetic algorithm. We're going to find which chromosomes give us the best results by randomly picking some seeing how they do, how many immune cells they produce, keeping the best, and allowing some of those best ones to mutate, which in this case means change a 1 to a 0 or something. right? And then see how they do. Keep the best of those, randomly mutate some, pick a few more random ones. And uh, the question is, you know, we said uh, what to optimize, the peak response, the number of immune cells. So we, I tried different things. And we do it about a thousand times. And here I tried maximizing all the immune cells, or just the memory ones, or maybe some combination of both. And I, you know, I, I'm just showing you some sample runs. So this is where we gave the vaccine boost. This is the immune cells we got out. And then we picked the best of the bests. So let's say they're these. By best, I mean the highest. And you notice that all the best of the best kind of give the boost at the same time. What did you say, six days? Yeah, it turned out three days. Three days was the best. And so when I um, compare three days, a boost on day three to a boost on day six, look, it looks a lot better. Well, you might say that's just your mathematical model. So I asked Sarah to check it out in the lab. And she, um, she looked at the day six uh, boost in the lab. And here's a, the day six compared to the day three. So I just like, that was her previous results. And so you can see even in the lab, the day three boost did a lot better. So it, I need to tell this to those Provence people who are doing it when? Every two weeks. Yeah. Um, so that was the first step. But if we want to really model the vaccine, the whole, you know, we need to show how what's missing from this model so far. I notice. So we've got the immune cells, got the vaccine, the immune cells. What's missing? Got the vaccine, the immune cells, but the cancer. We've got the cancer missing, the tumor. So we need to see how the vaccine interacts with tumors. So we've got to put that in our model. So that was the next step. And uh, this is work with uh, Lizette up at Harvey Mudd and Angela. And so we, we added, we, that was what I showed you was happening in the spleen or the lymph organ. Now we're going to add a tumor compartment and the blood compartment, so how you get between them. And then we have to get a lot of parameters and stuff. So here's a cartoon. of This is the spleen part, which is what you saw already, the dendritic cells and the immune cells. And they can go through the blood and get to the tumor compartment. And so there are a lot more equations now, but the variables uh, that we'll use, there aren't that many new variables. We've got tumor cells, the dendritic cells we already had, the activated T cells, and the memory cells we already had. 
We don't have many new cells. They just have to move around in these compartments. And so we can use what we had before, and then just the, the motion through the blood is just sort of in and out. And we ha now have the ability to put the vaccine in the blood, right? Before it was just kind of coming in from wherever. Or we can put the vaccine in the tumor compartment. And notice here, this looks a lot like that very early model I showed you. And in fact, it is. We've got our good old the Bill's Rad Sky Law, um, and which is still really useful. So it never goes away. This is a spleen compartment, which you already saw, so we won't talk about that too much. So now here we just, the first thing we have to validate our model, it's really complicated now. We found some data, and uh, the solid lines are our model. These little bars are the data. They look pretty good. And then we can, um, then we can mess around with it. We say, okay, we have a, so what were the questions we wanted to ask? Well, one question was maybe, is it better to put the vaccine into the blood or in the tumor, site of the tumor? It's a big question, controversy. So we can um, do this in our model. Here's uh, where they, the experiment they did, they actually injected the dendritic cell vaccine into the tumor. So that's the data and our model. And here we tried injecting it into the blood, and what happens? See here, these are the tumor sizes at four diff three different doses and one no treatment. So the no treatment looks the same as it should, but here the tumor actually was kept lower for longer if you injected the vaccine in the blood. That's what our model suggests. Don't inject it in the tumor, inject in the blood. Of course, the tumor is still growing, so it's not a very good vaccine yet, right? Um, but we can also, since we have this model, we can look inside organs, right, in silico. We, we can't do in people, much less um, sick people. <laughs> so we, we can look inside, and, and there are a lot of non-intuitive things going on. You know, if you, if you the, this upper one is when you inject the vaccine into the tumor, the lower one's when you inject in the blood, and this is the number of, tum of uh, of immune cells, killer immune cells, right, in the spleen. So it looks like actually injecting the tumor, you get more immune cells, but remember they were less effective. So it's not always what's going on uh, in the factory that makes sense. It's like who's on the freeway, right, getting to where they're supposed to go. So anyway, you can sort of use these models as microscopes into things you can normally not see. Um, we can also use the model to decide who will respond? What part of that whole complicated cascade is most important? We call this a sensitivity analysis. And here's just um, looking at the final tumor levels in the dark bars. Which parameter, which thing in the model most affected the final tumor size? In this case, the one that's the largest negative. So which parameter, which thing mo made most affected the size of the tumor negatively. So the bigger this guy is, the smaller the final tumor size. So that would be a good parameter to be able to tweak, right? Make that bigger, you make the tumor smaller. Oh, this is called D. That one, you probably can't see it. Where is D in the big model? Guess what? It's in the De Pillars Run Skyla, right here. It's the kill rate, the overall kill rate of the tumor by the immune cells. So that makes sense that that would be an important thing. Could you ever change that as a therapy? Yes, in fact, they w they're working on that. They're working on ways to, on different cytokines that will make effector cells, killer cells, more effective. And so the, what they're trying to do now is package those things with, um, with the vaccines. So more on that later. Okay, and so here we did some experiments changing D. So changing D by just a tiny bit actually makes the tumor go away. This is the highest D level, middle and, and uh, lowest. So um, we, we compared that to without the vaccine, the D has no effect. So that's kind of interesting. And um, anyway, these are just a little peek at the kinds of things you could do with the model. Find out when to give the doses, what you might want to add to the vaccine, who might respond, uh, where to give the vaccine. Right? So all these questions we can answer. There's still some open questions. It's pretty hard to measure the immune response. Um, we'd like to now uh, 
try to, you know, since we have these big ongoing prostate cancer trials, uh, calibrate it to their vaccine and see if we can suggest something. Um, right now I'm working with Sarah on delivering vaccines along with other things packaged up in nanoparticles, packaged up in gels so that they can be released at different times and that's pretty cool. Um, and what other properties, you know, I just, we just looked at these cells as blobs. There is actually complicated mechanical properties. I'm working with someone else on understanding that, um, those properties and how we could model that. And um, all these things like the D and all that, how could we actually make those therapeutically reasonable? So um, there's still many, many questions and Lots of people working on this, but still lots of work to be done. So I just want to take a couple minutes to tell you about other projects. Because really, remember, I want to talk to you about talking to other people. Because <laughs> it's really fun. I just love doing math because I get to work with everyone. And um, everyone has a math problem. They might not know it. But somewhere in your work, there's a math problem. And so, for example, this is Aisha Nahero, who just got her PhD with me at CGU last May, and she worked on an algorithm for predicting fetal distress during labor, so uh, trying to avoid unnecessary cesareans. Um, this was my WAM group that Mary mentioned at the IMA, and uh, there we are, my particular group, there were nine groups, there's my group, and we worked on modeling anticoagulants because it's really hard to know whether you're taking the right amount of anticoagulant. Anyone who's ever had to take them knows that that's a huge issue. And so we did made this model in order to see whether the test they use, this INR test, actually tells you what's really happening. And so we could sort of do that microscoping inside the body with our model and compare the INR that you're measuring, which is on this axis, with the actual INR, the actual clotting time that we that we think was happening. And so sometimes the reading you got was too big, sometimes it was too small, right? And, uh, and so we think this could be really helpful. And in fact, we're talking to people at um, a company that makes these things now. So that's, that's pretty cool. And then uh, finally, this is uh, work with John Milton, who's up at CAC Science. He's discovered that he works a lot on how people balance, especially helping people stroke victims or whatever recover. And he discovered, just kind of by accident, that if you add a jiggle, just a random jiggle, you can balance better. I mean, you might kind of think of this as, you know, if you're trying to carry a really full bowl of soup, if you look at it and concentrate really hard, you're going to spill it. But if you kind of don't worry too much, you'll be OK, right? And so it's the same idea. This noise in the nervous system somehow makes you balance better. Here's a measurement they did by the guy just standing on a thing, and now he's standing on it, like, jiggling their Achilles tendon. <laughs> no, he's trying to balance the stick. They put this little noise in their Achilles, and it does much more stable. And so mathematically, we can write a function. We can show that mathematically that stabilization happens. We can find the best level of noise to use. And there are a lot of practical applications to this, right? Like imagine, I just went had a big wedding last weekend. My feet hurt so bad trying to dance on those shoes. You could uh, put jigglers in your high heels and dance for way longer. <laughs> so um, that's, that's the end of my talk. I want to thank Mary for organizing this. Thank you for listening. And now it's your turn to talk.